what would happen if Jesus didn't get crucified? Wow, you guys, these are something today. Because like every one of them, that's like a Dun Scotus question. I mean, over and over and over again, all these questions are very searching, and they've been entertained by the highest level theologians. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the Senior Publishing Director at Word on Fire. Today we're going to get some questions from some very cute and very precocious children. Uh, we haven't done one of these kids Q&A episodes in over a year, but now it's back. We're going to get questions from kids for Bishop Barron. I'm very excited, Bishop. Are you? <laughs> yeah, these are always fun. And the kids, as we say, the kids always ask really deep questions. And that confirms a theory of mine, you know, that we, we tend to knock this curiosity out of kids. And, you know, some, some hyper-trained theologian asking a technical question at a conference is never anywhere as interesting as the questions that spontaneously come from kids because they cut right to the chase. So they're good questions. You always tell that story of the young Thomas Aquinas. I don't know exactly what yeah. age he was, but he was a kid, and he asked this yeah. very probing, deep question about God's existence, right? But master, what is God? So the, the teacher was talking about God, and the young Aquinas said, yeah, but what, what is God? <laughs> Which is a darn good question. <laughs> all right, well, let's get into them. We got questions from kids all over the world, literally. Good. We've got Americans and Croatians, <laughs> Canadians, England. So let's get nice. into it. This first one comes from Roscoe. Roscoe is in your state, California. She's asking about Jesus. Here's Roscoe. Good. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Roscoe, and I am seven years old. I live in California, and my question is, why did Jesus appear so long ago? Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. You know, let me look at it this way. Maybe really, in the grand scheme of things, he didn't appear that long ago. You think, like, the scientists tell us the universe came into being, like, 14 billion years ago? Think of, like, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, how long that seems. Then like 100,000 years, a million years. You're not anywhere even near a billion at that point. Now, go to 14 billion. It's like impossible to imagine how old the universe is. The Earth came into being, they think, around like 4 billion years ago, right? Human beings, like our most distant ancestors, say around like three or 400,000 years ago. So when you look at it that way, Jesus 2,000 years ago wasn't that long ago. If you look at like, you know, the big like time clock and is it's all of the time of the universe, well, we'd be here and Jesus would be like right there. You know, so in a way, he didn't come that long ago. Another way to look at it, he came when the world was ready for him. The Lord had to prepare a people to receive him, right? Jesus makes sense in light of, of Israel. The Lord had to form this holy people of his according to his law, according to his mind, according to right liturgical practice. And even though you know Israel failed and so on, but they were the holy people, the chosen people, who were the receptacle for the Messiah when he finally came. So you might say Jesus came the minute he he could have come, that when the Lord had prepared a people to receive him. So that's kind of looking at it from both sides. That In one way, it really wasn't that long ago. Another way is he came when we were finally ready for him. Maybe prior to that, the world, Israel wouldn't have received him and the world wouldn't have understood him. So he came at the right time. Even though we might not fully understand that, but if God, who knows all things and God who governs the whole universe, Jesus came at the right time when it was the right moment for him to come. Maybe to some it seemed too early, some it appeared too late, but for God, it was, it was the right time. Great question, Roscoe. Next up, we have Marie. She's five years old. She lives in Missouri. She's got a real thoughtful question about the incarnation. Good. Here's Marie. Ah, okay. My name is Murray, and I'm five, and I'm from Missouri. My question is, why did God the Father send Jesus to be born if God the Father could be born himself? Wow. 
<laughs> That's a question that some of the greatest theologians, no kidding, have thought about. How would I approach this? Think about this. God speaks. God speaks in, in the world, right? So the, God's, God's word you can see in, in the beauty of, of creation. God speaks in his holy people, Israel. God speaks finally his son. Now, who's the speaker? If God speaks, who's the speaker? We call that the father. The father's the one who speaks. What's the word he speaks? We call that the son, don't we? And so we say God made the world through and in the son. That's why the world is so marked by, by beauty and, and by order and harmony, right? And so that word that the Father spoke from the beginning of creation, he now speaks fully in Jesus of Nazareth. That's why we say it's the second person, it's the Son, who becomes incarnate. Because the Father spoke him and the word was spoken in Jesus of Nazareth. So in that way, uh, it makes sense, doesn't it? That he's the one, it's the second person of the Trinity, the word spoken who becomes incarnate. Now, here's the cool thing, too. Think about the Trinity again. So the Father is the speaker. The Son is the word spoken. Who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the one who interprets the word for us. When people met Jesus and they heard him and they saw what he did, what was it that made some of them say, ah, you're the Son of God. You're, I'm going to give my whole life to you. You're the center of my life. You're, you're everything. What made them say that? You, it's the Holy Spirit working within them, right? The Holy Spirit that was interpreting the word in them. So the Father speaks, the Son is the word spoken, and now the Holy Spirit is the interpreter of the word. So I know maybe it's a little bit too fancy language, but it's a way of saying why it's appropriate that the Son of God is the one who became incarnate in, uh, in Jesus. But that's a question that goes way back to the beginning of the church. A lot of our theologians wondered about that too. Thank you for that, Marie. Next up, we have a young Englishman. His name is Arthur. He lives in Cambridge, England, and he's asking about how you can be happy in heaven if people or things you love aren't there. So here's the young Arthur. Oh, gosh. Okay. Hello, my name is Arthur, and I live in... Cambridge, England. I am eight years old. My question is, how can you be perfectly happy in heaven if someone you love is not there? Arthur, can I ask you please to give me your accent? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I sounded like you. That's beautiful. <laughs> See, we Americans, we, we really admire that beautiful English accent that you have. I have this awful accent from Chicago. <laughs> I wish I could take mine, put it over there, and have your accent. It was just beautiful. And you're in Cambridge, too, which is one of the great cities in the world for the intellectual life, the great university in Cambridge. So beautiful. I'm glad you're thinking, too, about these serious things, because that question, too, has been entertained by a lot of our great theologians. Here's, let me give you a quick answer to it. What's heaven? Heaven is living in total union with God, that I'm thinking God's thoughts, I'm feeling God's feelings, I'm totally aligned to God. I see things totally from God's perspective. Therefore, in heaven, I'm going to see all things as they've been properly arranged and ordered by God. Are there, now we don't know this for sure, Arthur, we don't know for sure. The church has it pronounced on it. Are there some people who are in, in hell that are forever uh, apart from God? Well, if there are, and we know that in heaven, we know it from God's perspective, that they're there because they've resisted God's love. They're there, if I can put it this way, as a result of God's justice. And so I, I see it as rightly arranged. And so my happiness is not compromised by that. But let me answer now in a somewhat different way. Because I think it's, it's okay to follow the instinct of your question. Can I be fully happy if someone that I deeply love is, is um, apart from God? Think of a mother of seven children, and she's in heaven, and six of her children are in heaven, but there's a seventh one still on earth who's, who's really heading the wrong way. What's her attitude? 
Oh, who cares? <laughs> I'm fine. You know, six of my kids are fine. No, I, I, if I know mothers, she'd be passionately interested in saving this last child, right? That I would say part of her heaven is her passion to set things right and her passion to, to find and rescue this child of hers. And so I, I think we can hope that our friends in heaven, our friends in heaven even now are like that. I think of, you know, maybe ancestors of mine that I never knew who are in heaven, but they, they know about me and they know, oh, there's my great, 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 great grandson that I never knew, but, but I'm in heaven and I, and I want him. I, I want him to find his way to the Lord. And so they're passionate to set things right and they, they express their love for me that way by interceding for me and praying for me. So I, I like your question. I like the instinct behind it. And I think that's okay to think that people in God's world love us and they're still very interested in helping us get where, where God ultimately wants all of us to be. I love, Bishop, some of the questions we've had already, some of the ones coming up. Kids seem to be very interested in what we might technically call modal met metaphysics. What what would have happened if this, or what might have happened if this, yeah. or what if possible world this happened? And this next question from Samuel in Canada well, you know, is along those let me, lines. Let me just pause there for a second. It's very interesting what you say because, you know, when I was coming of age, there was such a tendency to say religion is really about, you know, social justice. It's really about care for the poor. And, you know, it's concerned about making this world better. And it is. Okay, don't get me wrong. Don't write me letters. It is about that. You know, we're concerned about building up the kingdom of God, all that. But we tended, my generation anyway, tended to forget almost, the, call it the transcendent part of religion, the, the eschatological dimension of religion, the, the heaven and hell and ultimate things. But look how kids are very naturally attuned to those questions. They, they, they get the importance of them. And that's... Um, that's an important indicator for us, I think. Well, here's another one of those questions along those lines. It's from Samuel yeah, okay. in Canada. He wants to know, what would have happened if Jesus did not get crucified? Here's his question. Hi, I am Samuel. I am nine years old. I live in Canada. My question is, what would happen if Jesus didn't get crucified? Wow, you guys, these are something today. Because like every one of them, that's like a Dun Scotus question. I mean, over and over and over again, all these questions are very searching, and they've been entertained by the highest level theologians. How uh, would I approach this one? Um, could God have saved us some other way? Yeah. Yeah. God's God. God can do what God wants. Thomas Aquinas said that. God could have saved us some other way. But he says there was no more fitting way for God to save us than for God to become one of us out of love, to go all the way down into what frightens us the most, to go all the way into our sin, go all the way into death itself, and thereby rescue us. Think of, of Frodo going into Mordor, that Frodo had to go into this darkest place, the very heart of it, right, to deal with the problem. So what would have happened if Jesus hadn't died? Well, I mean, God could have found another way to save us. But this is the way that was most beautiful and most fitting. That's what Thomas Aquinas says. The most fitting way for God to save us was by becoming one of us and, and going into what frightens us the most and then bringing us out of it through his love. So um, we could have been saved otherwise. But there's no more beautiful and fitting and powerful way for us to have been saved than by this beautiful act of, of Jesus' death on the cross. Um, you know, people said, like, couldn't one drop of his blood have saved us? Let's say Jesus had been crucified. He shed one drop of his blood and then was rescued from the cross. Could that have saved us? Yeah. I mean, God is God and God could save us any way he wants. But there was no more perfect, fitting, beautiful way for us to be saved than by the cross of Jesus. So that's a way I think our great theologians would answer that really cool question. All right, let's go from Canada back to stateside. We're going to hear now okay. from Rosemary. She's four years old from Wisconsin. She's got a question about God. Here's Rosemary. Okay. Hi, Bishop Barry. My name's Rosemary. I'm four years old. I'm from Wisconsin. 
And my question is, can God, can God die? <laughs> I love that. You got my accent there. See, I'm from the Midwest, too. So we went from Cambridge all the way back to the Middle West. And so that's good. Wow, what a question. I, again, <laughs> these are all, aren't they? These are all like really searching questions. Can God die? Well, now maybe, Brandon, you can help me because you, you deal with your own kids. And, and I, I have trouble finding the language sometimes that they could, they could get. Can God die? No, God is a spirit. God is immortal. God is unchangeable. So God's not like us. So we have bodies that sort of fade away and they get sick and they, and they, they die. We change, right? We go from one condition in one state to another. Well, God in himself isn't like that. Spirits don't die. God's immutable. He doesn't change. God is ever living. You know, we, when we address God in prayer, we'll say ever living God. Well, that means a God that doesn't die, right? So in one sense, no, no, God in himself can't die. But, and here's where your question see is so important. God became one of us. That means God took to himself a nature like ours. So that in Jesus, in Jesus, God knows from the inside what it's like to be human. I don't know if that makes sense to you, the nice lady who asked me the question, the young lady. God knows what it's like to be human. God God takes to himself humanity. And so what we say, and Brand, I'll ask you maybe to help me with the language. What we say is, in his human nature, God died on the cross. So, see, Jesus died on the cross. Does that mean that God in his own nature died? No. But in his human nature, he died. Meaning he fully experienced that human reality of death. So can God die? The answer is, I hate to be this, you know, kind of mysterious, yes and no. So can God die? Well, no, not in himself. God never dies in his own nature. But can God die in his human nature? The answer to that is yes. So help me, Brandon. I know that language probably is a little bit too difficult for our young questioner, but how would you put That's that? That's good. Here's, here's how I've done it with my kids. So uh, w both sides of those equations, can, can God in the divine nature die? I say no, and here's why. E each of us have life. You know, you have life. When you yeah. die, you don't have life. But God doesn't have life. He is life, and is life, life yeah. can't die. Life itself yeah. can't die. But then when you bring it to the question of the incarnation, I've explained to our kids that what death is, is the separation of the body from the spirit, when your spirit and your body are divided. So Christ took on human flesh. He took on a body, but on the cross, his spirit and his body were divided. They come back together during at the resurrection, but at, for a moment, they're, they're split apart. And by that definition, he died. But as you say, the divine nature can't ever cease. That's, that's forever no. existing. No, yeah, that's a better answer than I gave. You're, you're no, right. I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, let's turn now to Aiden in Springfield, Good Missouri. Um, and yeah. again, continuing our trend of eschatological questions, he's okay. asking how God's going to end the world. So here's Aiden's question. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Bishop. My name is Aiden. I'm from Springfield in Missouri. My question is, how will God end the world? How will God end the world? Well, you know, I'm going to state it positively because I could talk about the way the physical universe will end. They talk about the the big, you know, crunch or it just sort of peters out, you know, into nothingness and all that. But I'm going to try to answer it in biblical terms. God wants to marry the world that he's made, if I can put it that way. You know, when a, a man marries a woman, they, they have this beautiful relationship of great friendship and intimacy, and, and they share their lives, right? What God wants, the Bible says, is to, is to marry us and indeed marry the world that he's made. He wants the world to come to himself and to find its fulfillment in him. Uh, the Bible talks about when Christ will be all in all. 
And what that means is what begins in Jesus. See, because Jesus is, we say, both divine and human. He's like the marriage between God and us, right? Or between God and the world. They, they marry in Jesus. Well, think of Jesus now as like a seed that's planted, and now it's going to grow, 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 so that ultimately, when the world ends, it's a great wedding banquet. It ends as all of creation being gathered to God in friendship and love. That's what God wants. So that's how it will end. It'll end, I don't know if you've been to a wedding reception yet, this young questioner. I remember the first one I went to, I, was, I think I was eight. Uh, my cousin got married and I went to that. And um, I've been to a lot since then. But you know, think of a wedding reception as just kind of this great celebration. Everyone's in a good mood and there's a lot of good food and there's dancing and there's music and fun. And it's a symbol, isn't it? It's a symbol of what God wants for us. That's how the world ends. Not with a, with a bang or just a whimper. <laughs> the world ends in a great wedding banquet uh, of God marrying his, his creation. That's how I see it. All right, we have a couple questions left here. Next up is Tyler. He's eight years old, lives in Ohio. He's asking about the devil and heaven. Here's his question. Okay. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Tyler Marhefka. I am eight years old, and I, I am from Winona, Ohio. I was wondering, how did the devil get kicked out of heaven? By my research... I thought that once he made it to heaven, he n never got kicked out. Thank you. Boy, these are such great questions. And you're doing theological research already. That's <laughs> I terrific. love that. By, by my research, yeah. Yeah, that's terrific. Here's the thing. I think for every rational creature, meaning a creature like with a mind and a will, that's whether you're an angel or you're a human being, there's something like a test. Now, not because God's being difficult or God's being like a mean teacher. You know, you got to take a test. If heaven is the life of love, right, and love means that you really want the good of the other, you, you want it, you are choosing it, you have to go through something like a test or a trial to show that you're capable of love. I don't know if that makes sense. If it's all like just given to me, like, boom, I just got everything that I, I want. Well, okay, then I'm a sort of wealthy person, but I've not loved yet. And the heart of heaven is love, and love has to be a choice. Well, if it's a choice, there's got to be something like, okay, I could do this or I could do that, right? So think about like if, if someone is your friend, but like they, they had to be your friend. There, there was no choice in the matter. Their parents told them, you got to be friends with this guy. Well, would you trust that friend? No, you'd say he's just doing what his parents forced him to do, right? Or someone held a gun to him and said, you, you got to be nice to this other kid. Well, I, I don't trust that he's my friend. But now you got someone who had a choice, who said, yeah, I could be your friend or I could, I could reject you. And I've chosen to be your friend. Now you can trust him. Now you know that person really likes me, right? So think now God and, and us, God and angels. Does God hold a gun to our head and say, you better love me? Well, I mean, he could, I suppose. He could threaten us. But then do we really love him? No, we're, we're being compelled. God gives both angels and us a choice. Okay. Do you love me? And, and you can say no, or you can say yes. A devil is a fallen angel. So maybe, maybe bracket heaven for a second. Just say, an angel who had a choice. Do I stand with God, or do I stand against God? Some said, no, I, I'm going to stand against God. They lost friendship with God. They lost intimacy with God. In that sense, they were kicked out of heaven. Not like God's being mean, but they, they sort of left of their own accord, if that makes sense. Well, now, we have something similar in our life. We have a whole lifetime, and we're being called upon every day to say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I'm, I'm going to be your friend. Lord, I'm standing with you. And we're, we're being tested, if you want, but again, not because God's being mean or, or a tough teacher. 
we're being drawn ever more into the way of love. Now, once we pass that test and we really have entered into love of God and we're fully in the presence of God, that's heaven. We're never, we're never going to leave. That's true. Once we're there and we've passed the test, so to speak, and we've made the choice of love, well, I, God, I, I'm in the presence of God. How would I possibly leave? So that's why you're right. Your research is right in saying once you're in heaven, you can't leave. You won't leave. So think now of the saints in heaven and think of the angels who are in heaven with the Lord. They're not going to leave. Those who aren't there, both angels and human beings, are there because they absolutely insisted on it. <laughs> Does that make sense? They absolutely insisted, I don't want to be there. And so in that sense, they didn't pass the test. hope that makes a little bit of sense. Brandon, what would you, what would you add to that? Oh, not much. I think between your explanation and Tyler's research, he's on the right yeah. path to figuring <laughs> it right out. He's on the right path. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's close with one more question. This one is okay. from, I think, Matei. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Matei is a nine-year-old in Croatia, all the way on the other ah, side of the world. Good. Um, yeah. So here's a good question about God from Matei. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Matei. I live in Croatia. I have nine years old. My question is... Does God like when we discover something? Hmm. Croatia. You know, my uh, assistant here in Santa Barbara is named Sylvia, and she's from Buenos Aires. That's where she was born and raised. But her family is Croatian, and she speaks Croatian. And uh, so it just reminded me of Sylvia as I listened to you. Yes. <clears throat> See, God, God wants us to be fully alive. One of my heroes is St. Irenaeus, uh, who, by the way, Irenaeus was from your part of the world. He's from the kind of the eastern part of the Mediterranean there. He said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. What does God want? He wants us fully alive in every way, physically, spiritually, morally, and intellectually. God delights when we come to some great achievement. In fact, I would say it's God who's always drawing us to these great achievements. When you want to do something that's excellent or that's beautiful or that's morally right or that's intellectually rich, it's God who's drawing you. Say, come on, come on. So think of all the great scientists who've discovered things. Again, someone from your, your part of the world, uh, Aristotle, think of these a scientist and looking at the animals and trying to understand how they work and, you know, uh, trying to think things through deeply. God loves that. God delights in that. The sciences keep advancing. Now, why? Because they want to know the truth more and more and more. Who's God? He's the truth itself, right? So it's God that's drawing them all the time. And so when you discover something, God loves that. God loves that. He lives for that stuff. All right, that, that we we become more like him, the more we attain and, and we we achieve something excellent and we do something morally right and we we uncover some truth. So I, I love that question. I think yes, God delights when we discover uh, new things. Well, listen to all the young men and women, all the boys and wow. girls who have sent in these tremendous questions. Thank you. Keep asking them. These are great questions. And if you're a parent who has kids and you want to send their questions to Bishop Barron, send them in. Do it at the website, askbishopbarron.com. Sometime in the future, we'll do another one of these kids Q&A episodes. And Arthur, send me your accent. I want your <laughs> accent. <laughs> I want maybe Arthur can record an, one of your books as an audio book. I oh, think that'd I'd be love delightful. It. You, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> As we wrap up here, I wanted to mention something we just announced a few days ago, which is the Word on Fire Liturgy of the Hours subscription booklet. You can learn more at wordonfire.org slash pray. 
If you're looking to deepen your prayer life or perhaps get into the Liturgy of the Hours for the first time, I know of no better, easier way to do it than these new booklets. Bishop Barron and I will have a whole nother discussion about the Liturgy of the Hours in the future. Uh, but for now, check it out. This is um, something brand new that we've been working on for a while and have just now brought to the public. Again, the Word on Fire Liturgy of the Hours booklet. You can learn more at wordonfire.org slash pray. Well, thanks so much to the kids and the parents and all of you for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel.